My name is Bill Edwards, and I founded Chassis Engineering over 12 years ago with the goal of providing you, the professional or home builder, with the finest chassis and suspension components available at a price you can afford. Today, our modern 20,000 square foot facility in Jupiter, Florida, provides us with the ability to manufacture, package, and distribute the very finest drag racing suspension and chassis components available from anyone. Let's take a walk around and see just what makes Chassis Engineering the industry leader. First, when you call Chassis Engineering, you'll talk to one of our knowledgeable sales advisors, who are both experienced racers and fabricators, all of whom have many years of experience in both building and racing the same kinds of cars you do. They can answer your questions and offer valuable advice during the exciting process of building your own car. Our modern air-conditioned manufacturing facility is staffed by enthusiasts who know race cars inside and out. Their years of experience in building, racing, and maintaining race cars is reflected in the quality of the products we sell. This gives us the ability to respond quickly to industry trends, maintain quality control, and keep the shelves stocked so you don't have to wait weeks for orders placed today. Our fully stocked warehouse contains virtually every item in our catalog ready for immediate shipment so you don't have to wait, including the largest inventory of strange engineering racing axles and spools, Willwood disc brake kits, and coilover springs in the country. We also provide attractive packaging and detailed instructions with most of our products to help you make your installation go as smoothly as possible. Along with those written instructions, we now provide video instruction for some of our suspension systems that provide you with step-by-step -step instructions that make the installation of these systems as easy as possible. All our video and written instructions are done for the home builder, building a car in his own garage. And we'll take you step-by-step -step through the installation process just the way you do it at home. So, let's get started on your car. Today, we'll be working on an early model Camaro and showing you how to install either a four-link or ladder bar rear subframe and suspension. First, here's a list of the tools required to do the job. You'll need the following. A floor jack, jack stands, a sawzall, air chisel, a grinder, an air sander, a carpenter's square, a plumb bob, a three-foot level, an angle finder, tape measure, torch, chalk line, and a wire feed welder. Also, you're going to need a flat, level surface where, we, where the car can remain undisturbed until the job is completed. Our first step is to mark the axle center line on the rear fenders using a carpenter's square and a magic marker. Lay the square on the floor, even with the edge of the tire and mark this location on the floor. Do the same at the front edge of the tire, lining the square up with the edge of the wheel and mark the floor. Using the square, find the center of the two marks, mark this location on the floor, and using your plumb bob, centered over the center mark on the floor, mark the fender. Repeat this procedure on the other side. After placing the car on jack stands, now is the time to remove all the existing components that will not be used. This includes fuel tank, brake and fuel lines, drive shaft, and exhaust system. Use a tape measure to measure from the axle center line forward to the rocker panel and place a mark 
at 38 inches for a ladder bar system or 33 and a half inches for a four link system. This will be your reference point for removing the existing factory floor. After removing the interior and carpet, chalk a line on the floor approximately four inches ahead of the marks made previously on the rockers. This will provide working room when installing the subframe. Now, set the car at the installation height of eight inches from the floor to the bottom of the rocker panels using wood blocks or two by fours. This installation height will allow you to get the car down to the lowest possible recommended ride height. Front wheels will need to be removed to accomplish this. Jack stands must be placed under the rear quarters to prevent body flex after the floor is removed. Now, using your sawzall, air chisel, and torch, remove the factory floor, inner fenders, and package tray from the chalk line back. This should be a rough cut only. Final trimming will be done later during the aluminum floor and wheel well installation. You should now have a pile of parts removed from the car similar to this one. The first step before installing the new subframe is to go back and recheck some important dimensions. Make sure that the car has not been moved during the process of removing the floor and other components and that the car is at the recommended 8 inch installation height as measured from the floor to the bottom of the rocker and is level side to side and front to back. Notice that the 8 inch measurement is to the bottom of the rocker and does not include the lip created by the pinch weld. Before we can install the subframe, you must be sure the car is level side to side and front to back. Here we, here we are using the 2x3 cross member laid on top of the rockers and a level to check to be sure the car is level side to side. Check in several locations and shim as necessary. When the car is level, you must now locate the center of the car as measured from the inside of the rockers and mark this location on the floor using a small carpenter's square. This mark will be used later to chalk the chassis center line on the floor. Using a small square laid up against the front frame and aligned with a factory hole for reference, mark the floor. Repeat on the other side and mark this location on the floor. Using a tape measure, locate the center between these two marks and mark this location on the floor. This will be your front reference for locating the chassis center line. Now, using a chalk line, snap a line from the front chassis center line to the rear center line previously marked on the floor. Using the marks made previously on the rear fenders to locate the axle center line, drop a plumb bob from these marks and mark the floor. Do this on both sides and chalk a line between these marks. This is your perpendicular line and these chalk lines will be your reference points for installing your subframe and suspension. They must be accurate and care should be taken while doing this. It's a good idea to spray the chalk lines with clear paint or trace them with a magic marker so they won't be lost during the installation. Using the axle center line chalked on the floor we can now locate the correct location for the 2x3 cross member. By measuring forward 38 inches for a ladder bar system or 33 and a half inches for a four link system. Using a square, mark the rockers. This mark will be the front edge of the cross member. Using a three inch wide piece of cardboard, make a template to fit the rockers so that the bottom edge is eight inches from the floor. This will be used to fit the 2x3 cross member to the rockers. Make a mark on each rocker at the outside of the template. Measure the distance between the marks on the rockers to determine cross member width. To fit the cross member to the car, 
you must first locate the approximate center of the drop section of the cross member and mark this location. Measure from the center mark one half the distance previously measured between the marks on the rockers and mark this location with a square. Trace the template on the cross member. Then measure from the outside line on this side to the opposite side and draw a line using a square at the total cross member width as measured on the rockers. And trace the template onto the cross member. Cut and trim the cross member to fit. For ladder bars, tack the cross member in place with the front edge of the cross member aligned with the marks on the rockers at 38 inches from the axle center line. Use a square and a level to properly align the cross member in the car. For four lengths, the cross member should be positioned at 33 and a half inches from the axle center line. Tack weld only. Finish welding will be done later. At this time, we can now place the wheels and tires under the car to determine frame rail width as well as rear end width. Carefully position the tires under the car centered on the axle center line on the floor, being careful to allow proper clearance for suspension travel between the tire sidewalls and inner fenders. One inch minimum clearance is required. Measure between tire sidewalls to establish frame rail width, leaving one inch of clearance per side between sidewalls and frame rails. Measure from the backs of the rims to determine total rear end width. This dimension will be your wheel to wheel measurement and used when ordering a rear or when shortening your own rear. Your sidewall to sidewall dimension, less two inches for tire clearance, will be your outside to outside frame rail dimension. Using the chassis center line under the two by three cross member, mark the floor with your frame rail dimensions centered on the chassis center line. In this application, the outside to outside dimension for the frame rails is 26 inches or 13 inches from the chassis center line per side. Mark the cross member using a square. This line on the cross member will be the outside edge of the frame rails. The first step in fitting the frame rails is to position the back of the rails at the correct height and location on the rear valance. This height can be between 23 and 27 inches as measured from the floor to the top of the rail. Notice that in our application, a reinforcement patch has been tacked in place on the valance due to the poor condition of the sheet metal on this car. This step is not usually necessary. With the rear of the rails in position and the front of the rail laying on the two by three cross member, we can measure the amount to be cut from the back of the rails. On a four link rail, do not shorten by cutting off the front piece. This will incorrectly position the brackets for the suspension. Leave a half inch more material than necessary and trim as needed for a good fit. On a ladder bar system, you must shorten each rail a little at a time to get a good fit. Fit these rails by sliding the notched front into position first and trimming the back as necessary. With the frame rails properly trimmed to fit, we can now double check all dimensions before tacking the rails in place. Check to be sure that the back of the rails are at the correct height level from side to side and space the correct distance apart from the chassis center line. With four link rails, the job can be made easier by clamping the shock mount brackets to the two by three cross member to support the front of the rails while they are in position to be tack welded. With all dimensions double checked, tack weld the frame rails into position. Note that in this installation, there is no offset in the drivetrain, and the center of the cross member lines up with the chassis center line chalked on the floor. 
in some installations, you will have a driveline offset, and you will need to compensate for this offset during the installation. Refer to your written instructions for directions on how to do this. The first step to installing the suspension is to assemble the ladder bars, leaving approximately four to five threads showing on the rod ends and lower adjuster. Attach one of the rear end brackets with the bolts inserted from the bottom up. Also, slip the large three-quarter inch bolt from the bottom up through the front spherical rod end. Assemble the other bar, adjusting the rod ends so that it will fit directly onto the first bar. This will assure you that both bars are identical when installing them in the car. On a four-link car, assemble the four bars with a center-to-center -center distance of 23 inches. Check your lengths by laying the bars one on top of the other with the bolts inserted so that they are all the exact same length. Adjust the rod ends as necessary to achieve this. When the bars are assembled and adjusted to the same lengths, you can now bolt the rear end brackets to the ladder bars. On the passenger side ladder bar, you must first attach the diagonal link bracket to the lower bolt towards the inside or center of the car before attaching the nut. This will be the lower rear attachment point for the diagonal link. Now, you can bolt the front of the ladder bars to the brackets on the 2x3 cross member. On the driver's side bar, you must first install the front bracket with the 3 quarter inch hole for the diagonal link onto the bolt before inserting the bolt through the brackets and the ladder bar. Use a flat washer on each side of the rod end and use the middle hole on the brackets for initial setup. With the ladder bars attached to the frame, you can now position your already narrowed rear under the car using jack stands and sliding the ladder bars onto the tubes. Position the rear at the correct ride height by adjusting the stands to one half the tire diameter. For example, if you are using a 32 inch tall tire, your axle center line would be 16 inches from the floor. Use another jack stand to support the front of the rear so that the pinion is pointed directly at the transmission output shaft. Center the rear under the car using a square and measuring from the outside of each frame rail to the housing ends. Both sides should be the same. Mark the housing on each tube at the outside frame location. Another mark should be made 3 eighths of an inch to the inside of this mark to locate the outside edge of the brackets on the ladder bars. Position the brackets on the inside marks on the tubes. The ladder bars should be centered under the frame rails. Double check that the rear is correctly positioned and using a square, tack the brackets to the rear. To install four link brackets on the rear, follow the same procedures used with the ladder bar brackets to correctly align and position the rear under the car. With the rear properly positioned under the car, you can now install the brackets and four link bars. Using the bottom three holes as a guide, use a square aligned with the holes to position the brackets and tack in place. With either ladder bars or four link installed, we can now install the diagonal link which is used to position and hold the rear from moving side to side. Start by screwing in the left hand rod end and jam nut, leaving approximately three to five threads showing. Install this end into the bracket at the bottom rear of the ladder bars or forelink using only the bolt, since this is for measuring purposes only. Install the jam nut on the right hand rod end and using the bolt provided install a rod end on the front bracket. Hold the diagonal link rod in position and mark for the amount to be shortened and cut to length. It may be necessary to re-tap this end using a half 20 right hand tap after sizing with a 2964 drill. With the tube cut to the correct length, 
install the rod ends, and install in the car. This is how a properly installed diagonal link should look. By turning the link either left or right, you can adjust the rear to the left or right in the car. Now we can assemble the shock mounts for installation in the car. Here we have all the parts necessary to install one shock, which includes right and left hand shock brackets, weld on shock mount, upper shock mount tabs, mounting hardware, and shock mount jig. Begin the assembly by installing the upper shock mounts on the shock jig with the bolt provided. Note that we are not using the nylock lock nut provided in the kit. These nuts should be used only once and they should not be used where the heat of welding can melt the nylon. Next, bolt the left hand and right hand L-shaped brackets to the weld-on bracket, leaving two holes showing at the top. This will allow for adjustment in both directions later on. Now, bolt the shock jig to the L-shaped brackets. You are now ready to install this assembly in the car. Begin shock mount attachment by marking the rear two inches from the inside edge of the frame rails. This will be the position of the weld on lower mount and provides for adequate clearance between the coil spring and the frame rail. Using a square to align the bracket at 90 degrees from the floor, tack in place. Next, cut the shock cross member to the correct length to fit between the frame rails. Leave a little extra material so the cross member will fit tight and stay in position while being adjusted for correct placement. Mark the cross member on each side two inches from the frame rail to locate the center of the upper shock mounts. Note that the bolt must go in from the inside with the nut on the frame rail side. Otherwise, you will not be able to remove the bolt later. Reattach the L-shaped brackets and shock jig to the weld-on bracket and position in place. Use an angle finder to position the jig so that it is angled towards the back of the car five degrees from vertical. This will provide adequate clearance between the springs and the mounting brackets as the suspension moves through its range of travel. With the shock jig correctly positioned on the cross member, square and level the cross member in the chassis and tack in place. Now, tack the shock mount brackets to the cross member centered on the marks made previously. Be sure that neither the cross member or the shock mount tabs protrude above the frame rail. 
This would make the installation of an aluminum floor more difficult. At this time, all of the components included in your kit should now be tacked in place in the car. If you are satisfied that everything is correctly installed, that the installation is square and level at all points, you can remove the rear end and the suspension components and finish weld the frame section and all brackets and tabs in the car. With finish welding completed, you can now reinstall the rear end and suspension, including the coilover shocks and springs, bolt on the wheels and tires, and set the car in the ground. Your installation of a narrowed rear frame is now complete. However, the installation of a roll bar or cage is absolutely necessary to prevent chassis flex on any car or truck with a narrowed rear frame. The following is a list of related components that will make the completion of your project easier and quicker. Contact your chassis engineering sales advisor or consult your catalog for more information on these and other items.